All right, today we are going to go through go through chapters two and three. Uh, I'm going to instead of like breaking down each letter to the seven churches in chapters two and three, I'm going to read all of the chapters and then I'm going to summarize the things that are commonly seen in these letters and kind of just uh, take out the, the common things that are seen and bring them together. So let me just read right away. Revelation chapter 2, write to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lamps and says, I know your works, your labor and your endurance and that you cannot tolerate evil. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. You have found them to be liars. You also possess endurance and have tolerated many, thing, many things because of my name and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works that you did at first. Otherwise I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in God's paradise. Write to the angel in the church in Smyrna, the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life, says, I know your affliction and poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will have affliction for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The victor will never be harmed by the second death. Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. The one who has a sharp, double-edged sword says, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is. And you are holding on to my name and do not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat sacrificed to idols, to commit sexual morality. In the same way, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent, otherwise I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone and a stone, a new name, inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. Write to the angel in the church of, in Thyatira. The Son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze, says, I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. Your last works are greater than the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my slaves to commit sexual morality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual morality. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her practices. I will kill her children with the plague then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who haven't known the deep things of Satan, as they say, I do not put any other burdens on you. But hold on to what you have until I come. The one who is victorious and keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations, and he will shepherd them with an iron scepter, and he will shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my Father, I will also give him the morning star. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 3. Write to the angel of the church in Sardis, the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. says, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. But if you are not alert, I will come like a thief, and you will have no idea what hour I will come against you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the victor will be dressed in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Write to the angel of the church, in Philadelphia, the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David who opens and no one will close and closes and no one opens, says, I know your works. 
because you have limited strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one is able to close. Take note, I will take those, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. Note this, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep from the hour of testing that is coming over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The victor, I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God and my new name. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creations. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't know that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed and ointments to spread on your eyes so you may see as many as I love I rebuke and discipline so be committed and repent listen I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door oh, my timer just went away um, is <laughs> I will come and have dinner with him and he with me. The victory I will give him a right to sit with me on my throne just as I also won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. Anyone who has an ear should hear and listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. All right, so just a few overview uh, points. Number one, these are about seven actual churches in seven actual places. However, remember how we learn in chapter one that everything in Revelation has a metaphorical and pictorial deeper significance. So the number seven revelation speaks regularly about many things, but one thing is about completeness. So this is written to seven actual churches, and yet it is speaking about the whole church at all times, in all places, between Christ's first and second coming. So, so these seven letters written to these seven actual churches in actual places is what God is saying to all churches at all times, in all places, between Christ's first and second coming. So, I've heard sometimes people say, well, this, you know, this, this particular one, Laodicea, it's the Roman Catholic Church, yada, 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 as if one of these descriptions of one of these churches targets one specific kind of church in history. No, this is making summary statements about all those in the visible church over all times, though it is speaking explicitly to these actual churches. Secondly, when it says to the angel of the churches, um, there's two things that people typically say. The angel is an actual angel that's connected to this church. Um, but if this is an angel connected to the church, then why is God writing to an angel? God doesn't write to angels. The angels are in heaven, so God doesn't need to write to angels, particularly to angels to a church. The second is angels represent uh, the leader of the church and so they speaking about the angel which also could be messenger and it's talking about the church leaders um, however I would take a third option angels in the book of Revelation is always talking about the, the, the throne of God and the heavenly state so when God is writing letters to the church and he's using this term angel what he's basically saying to the church that you are those on the ground who are connected to the heavenly domain and heavenly realm. And so I'm speaking to you in light of your heavenly domain and heavenly realm connection. Okay? So these letters to the churches with the angel reference before all of them, it's just making the connection between these churches on the ground and the heavenly domain that they are attached to. So here's what I want to do as we just kind of take some overview looks at this. And here's the first one. Is what we learn from this is that revelation needs to lead to our reasoning and not our reasoning to revelation. Six, actually seven times it is said, this phrase, anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. 
So John wants to tell the church then and now, listen, you, it's not what culture is saying to the church. It's not what reason and rationale is saying to the church. It's not what experiences and emotional intuitions are saying to the church. It's not what um, your mom or your dad or, 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 your, or your neighborhood or, or your family says to the church. But what does the Spirit of God say to the churches? And this is very important because the church always has a tendency to want to reason from the world to the Bible and not let the revelational truth of the Bible bring them to reason from that revelation. So over and over again, the church needs to listen to what God has revealed and then rationalize, not rationalize in light of reality and then go to revelation. So reason must be grounded in revelation, not revelation grounded in reason. Second thing from all these letters is we see that there is the right content but the wrong center. The right content but the wrong center. So it says in Ephesians 2, 4, this is to the Ephesians church, I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Now in the Greek it literally says you have abandoned the first love. So this is talking about a very specific kind of love. And the first love of the Christian is the love of them being saved, the love of them encountering the gospel, the love of Christ coming to them for the first time and them experiencing saving love. So basically, here's what's going on in these churches. They have, particularly in Ephesus, they have a right view of things, right view of doctrines, right view of ethics and God's law, but they're not being centered around the supremacy of gospel redemptive things and so secondary things are equal to primary things and or secondary things are greater than primary things and Ephesus has all this right theology but guess what they don't have a grace emphatic redemptive center where in their first coming to Christ they, they, they're really rooted and grounded in the fact that they're saved by grace they move on to putting that in the back seat and if you notice something, there is a progression of, of degression in these letters. So, and, and, and Ephesus says, you abandon your first love, the love you had at first. And then it says, you're tolerating those who believe bad gospel theology. And then it says, you have people that are teaching bad gospel theology. And then it says, you're dead. And then it says, you're just blind and naked. So, heresy starts with being orthodox without a Christological center. The, the, the total digression to being totally Laodicea, it starts with being Ephesus, where you are orthodox, but you are not mostly rooted and grounded in a Christ save you, not because of you center at, as an ongoing thing. So there's a right content and wrong center that is being addressed in the churches. Third thing that we see in these letters is that there is a supreme, not secondary danger that keeps getting addressed. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance that you cannot tolerate evil, but, I, but and you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. So he's talking about how you guys are being careful about aberrant theology. Verse chapter 220, I have this against you. tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my slaves. Verse, chapter 3, verse 3, Remember that what you have received and heard, and keep it and repent. So all of these references are saying that, listen, churches right now, all of you are experiencing persecution. All of you are experiencing, there's like physical plagues going on and, 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 and diseases. And, and there's, there's economic hardship and, and there's jail, there's people being jailed and whatnot. And what's interesting is that in all these letters, the greatest concern of God to the church in Revelation and now is theological error. It's not death. It's not persecution. It's not the plagues. It's not the economic difficulties of being a Christian. It is the most dangerous thing that churches need to always be wary about. It's not the temporal situational dangers, but the spiritual danger of having wrong views of God. That is the greatest danger the church must always be preoccupied. In the midst of chaos on the ground, be wary of theological errors. So supreme danger is errors that are uh, confusing God, not dangers in the world. But here's another thing 
that we can draw out from these letters that is very important for the churches to always consider is that we must be faithful from faith, not have faith from our faithfulness. We must be faithful from faith in Christ, not have faith from our faithfulness. You say, why do you say that? I'll, I'll read three verses, actually four. Chapter 2, 1. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands says. So God makes a reference to something about Christ, to believe about Christ, and then he begins to exhort the Ephesian church. 2 verse 8. Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna, the first and the last and the one who was dead and came to life said. So again, at the beginning of the letter, John makes a reference to something about Christ and what he does to be trusted in, and then he starts to exhort Smyrna about things. 3, 7, the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close and close and no one opens, says. So again, he's about to talk to the church and he starts talking about things about Jesus that should be trusted before you even hear things to be exhorted. 3, 14, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation, says. So in all of these letters, the church needs to understand that they must believe things about God's person, God's actions and promises in order to respond and react. They must receive things to respond. They cannot just start reacting, start responding, start acting apart from understanding things about Jesus that you're supposed to know and trust. So regularly over and over and over, it says you must receive this you must embrace this. You must look to this before you can even think about responding in America. And that's very important because the church tends to, when things are getting very dangerous, we tend to be reactive, not gospel receptive. We begin to just do stuff and run around. And, 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 and yet John is saying, listen, you must always receive things before you respond. You must always be a receiver of God's faithfulness as you're seeking to respond in a faithful response to Him. You must not be reacting and then receiving Christ, but receiving Christ, then reacting, which is why there's so many references about something about Jesus ascended and about his, who He is and what He has done and how that understanding then leads to all the abilities to respond. Here's a few more things that I see um, as we... Uh, get close to our first conclusion. Best life then, not now. That's something that keeps being said over and over and over is best life then in the new creation in its final stage, not now. So look at what happens at the end of almost all of these letters. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I will give the victor the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in God's prayer. So basically, there was a tree of life in the original creation. There is a tree of life in the final creation. And, and John is saying, listen, here's what you have to look forward to. Something that will be experienced in the final new creation, Eden, that is better than the first. Chapter 217. Anyone who has the ear should listen to what the Spirit says. I will give the victor some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a stone with a new name inscribed that no one knows except the one who received it. It's talking about how you will have your victorious experiential identity and glory at one point in time as your encouragement. 312. I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my God, and he will never go out again. And I will write the new Jerusalem which comes down from heaven of my God, and I'll write his new name, my new name on him. So almost every single time the church is being addressed, it starts with what the gospel has accomplished, what Christ has accomplished. It then begins to talk about things in time, and then it brings them all the way to what the gospel will bring you to in the end of eternity. So there is nothing in these letters that says, listen, you now, as the kingdom of God, should do your best to bring, you know, there's a, Michael Horry, one of my favorite theologians, says this, there's two ways to embrace a prosperity gospel. The first is your best life now, where you have like this idea that you should have some, because you're in Jesus and you've been experienced grace, you should now have this amazing present personal experience. The other form of the prosperity gospel is your best world now. That is a social justice gospel where we believe that 
having Jesus saving me somehow is his power to bring this utopic, amazing experience in the now. Um, and that's what Christianity is all oriented around. But in these letters which speak about how the church should see their reality as it's difficult, as it's broken, as it's painful, in every single letter it says, listen, you have a utopia, you have a bliss, you have an experience of of, of heaven that is then, not now. There is no guarantee or promise. So regularly, they are told that do not look. Listen, Babylon will try to give you a now utopia, heavenly experience. But you Christians uh, that are a part of my institution, your bliss, your heaven, your renewed earth is in the new heavens and new earth, not now. And there is this always referring to the then and overlooking the supremacy of the now. Another thing that we see, and I'll probably, let me see, I probably will, will, will say uh, two or three more things before we take a, a break and then pick it up. These letters and all of the letters, we see a call to persevere, not to seek for God to preserve you out of difficulty. For us to persevere through difficulty, not for God to preserve us out of difficulty. So look what it says in 2.10. Now I'm saying a lot of things, but I understand I'm, I'm summarizing seven letters and two chapters all at once. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. So basically, God is like, church, you're about to suffer. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison and test you. You have affliction for 10 days. So... It's getting really bad, and guess what? You're going to be put in jail. And here's, here's what I, what's going to happen. Be faithful until death. They're going to kill you, and I will give you the crown of life. So God does not say, don't worry. You're my children. I love you. I will preserve you out of danger, physical danger, temporal danger. I will, I will get you out of that. Just, just pray. Just know. I will preserve. I will, you will persevere through danger and I will take you all the way home. They're called to persevere, not seek for God to preserve them out of danger. 2.13. I know you are where Satan's shown is and you're holding to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan lives. One of their pastors or leaders was killed. He was not preserved. He was killed. And so one of the things that the church must always understand, otherwise they will begin to capitulate and compromise the culture and, and, and seek to kind of just be these cultural compromisers, is that we are called to persevere in the midst of spiritual danger, in the midst of physical and temporal danger. We're called to persevere and trust in the power of the resurrection and the hope of the new age and not live in this obsess this self-preservation obsession that is so common so often, particularly in our country. I would say we're more concerned with self-preservation than perseverance in affliction. And so all the churches need to know this. It's another thing that we see from the seven letters in these two chapters. And that is the wonder of weakness. The wonder of weakness. Now notice something. There's only two churches here that God does not threaten with a sword in your mouth or I'll come fight against you or, you know. There's only two letters that this is, that there is only affirmation given to. And, I, and, and, and basically they're the two letter the, 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 the two churches that have experienced Seeming from these letters, the greatest affliction, the greatest difficulty, the greatest lack. 2.8 says, I know your affliction, poverty, and yet you are rich. Those are the opposite things that are said about Laodicea. I know the slander of those that say that they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So according to John, the church that is most most needy, most weak, most broken, most lacking is the most pure 
because affliction and, and, and persecution and difficulty makes you small. It makes God big. It makes you dependent. It, it rids you of your ability to trust in earthly power and earthly resources and earthly uh, benefits. And it leads you to seek only Christ's benefits, only gospel benefits. And so the churches that are experiencing the most lack have the most robust fruitfulness. And the ones who have it a bit easier... All men at heart, but, but a bit easier, tend to be um, weak in faith. And so a lot of times in America we say things like this that are well-meaning, but they're not consistent with what we're learning God say about the churches in all ages. They say, thank you God that we in America can do everything with no persecution or affliction. And actually... Actually, that's never really good for the church to not experience testing and difficulty and resistance. The only two letters, the only two churches that are strong and seem to be very healthy are the ones that are in dire situations and have trusted the power of the gospel and the power of resurrection in their lack. When there is a weakness that brings up, there's a wonder and weakness that we see from these churches. And so right now, if we were to think about pandemic and if we were to think about, you know, the, the, the social unrest and the just hostility to Christianity which is surmounting, and we were to read these letters, we would be that there, there, there is a weakness that is beginning to brew that could be potentially wonderful and renewing to the church. And will be crippling to, it will be crippling to those who are, not, who are seeking to not embrace weakness, and trust Christ in weakness, but would rather seek to preserve their strength. So we'll stop there, and then we'll we'll pick up real quickly and continue to summarize these two chapters and seven letters and these concepts that, that unite them all.